Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Can I get some uh, answers in the chat section, please? Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Hopefully, I'm audible to everybody. That's what I'm hoping. And uh, I welcome you all to today's webinar to uh, from whichever part of the world you are attending. So I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. And today, uh, we have a special guest for, uh, for our webinar today. It's Sarah Rigsby, uh, who has uh, 15 years of experience in medical speech language pathology. She has specialized in stroke rehabilitation, dysphagia, infant feeding, and critical care. So she has practiced in USA before moving to Nepal in 2013. So she has volunteered as speech language pathologist in Tansen Mission Hospital, for those of you who know, it's in Palpa. And now she is working as a speech language pathologist in INF Pokhara. And I'm very privileged to welcome you here. Uh, over to you, Sarah, and look forward to have a wonderful session. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, shall I go ahead and start and do the screen sharing or should we wait? Do we wait? Uh, I think we can start. Okay, let me see if I can figure out screen sharing. Yes. I'll be uh, here. Says, yeah, yeah, just press this. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, in the in the meantime, like I think there's a share screen button there which you can press. It says, that you, it says the host has to dis has disabled screen sharing. So I think you may have setting first. Yeah, what I'll do is. I'll yeah, I think it's advanced settings maybe. Yes. So now you try doing it now. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh, okay. Oh, yeah, me... I think we're there. Okay. How are we? Can everyone see the? Can you see the yeah. important functional goal setting? Great. Well, again, my name is Sarah Rigsby. I've been a speech pathologist um, since 2005, and I practiced in the United States before uh, my family and I moved to Nepal. I put my email address on this front page as a contact in case if anyone later has any questions or wants some contact information for me. Um, thank you so much for having me. I've heard about Shan. Um, I'm not often in Kathmandu. One time I tried to attend a meeting. Attend and, a meeting. Um, but I'm so um, happy to, so happy to, to um, be yeah. here. I'll just move some microphone. I'll just move some microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. Are we better? I think so. Oops, somehow. I'm... So, um, just so you all know, all of the patient videos and um, photos have been used but with verbal permission. I have changed names for privacy. In some of the videos, the patients are saying their names, so of course you'll hear their names. Um, and then also please just uh, to not copy or use these slides without my permission um, because I have asked could I present these um, cases but I have not asked could they be presented outside of this setting. Uh, so my background, I grew up in the United States, uh, did my bachelor's in speech and hearing science and then from there did my master's in speech language pathology. Um, worked in four different states in many different settings during my time in the United States. Um, and we moved to Nepal in 2013. My husband's a board certified family medicine physician who now has a rehabilitation focus. And we have two young children, or we had two young children. Now they're eight years old and 10 years old, so they're getting bigger. Um, as Vivek Sir said, worked in Tencent for uh, about two different times of about two and a half, three years. And then since September have been in Pokhara and was able to start um, with my government visa in January to be in the hospital. Um, so it's been a pleasure to work in a few different places in Nepal. 
and uh, work with other professionals here as well. I've listed just my specialties and certifications, mainly so that you all know things that you can ask me about and things that I may be able to be helpful with. Um, you, you don't want to ask me about stuttering. You don't want to ask me about articulation of the cuff and puff sound because I can't hear them. Um, but um, I do, you know, maintain my American Speech and Hearing Association uh, C's and I am an international board certified lactation consultant as well. Um, modified barium swallow studies, fees, the LSVT voice therapy, vital stem, NICU, cleft palate feeding, uh, passing mirror valve, uh, which are speaking valves, trach care and decannulations, um, and critical care stroke unit. Um, and then I've also served as a clinical instructor at a few different universities in the United States. Um, I so enjoyed last week's talk um, by Maxi Ma'am. That was a beautiful talk. My poor family was kind of uh, listening in the background and kept hearing me say, that's right, that's right. She said, this is perfect. So I so appreciated what she said um, about swallowing dysphagia evals and resources. A few things that I wanted to show you all and give you a few resources. Um, at the end, during the questions, there were some questions about uh, tracheostomy patients, speaking valve placements, um, and the website passingmuir.com here has, um, and then you go to menu, and then you go to clinicians, and then you go to free CEUs. And they have great videos and great continuing education about um, tracheostomy ventilators, changes in anatomy, respirations, uh, trach sizing. So if you, some of the terms that she used last week that I've listed here, if they're not familiar to you, uh, I would really suggest you go and you try to educate yourself further because trachs um, and critical care speech pathology are wonderful and needed it here in this country and in lots of other places, but people can die if we don't know what we're doing. Um, I had a colleague who, uh, a nursing colleague in the U.S. who forgot to deflate a cuff on someone's trach before she placed the speaking valve and a patient died. So it's serious. Um, so if you don't feel like you have a great understanding of that, please go to that um, website for some free education. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about through her presentation is understanding the disease processes and how they can affect swallowing. And I've listed multiple ones there. Um, and then the last tip I had was asking our physio and occupational therapy and our nursing colleagues about their reasoning behind things. You know, why are, why are you turning the patient like this? Why are you uh, placing the tube like this? What, what does this blood pressure mean? Why are you concerned about it? That educates us. Um, I didn't know how to transfer a patient until a physio showed me how. Now I can encourage um, families. And another thing, we can also cross train. I want my physio and OT colleagues, I want my nursing colleagues to tell the family over and over again to help the patient do oral care if they're NPO. I want everyone who sees that patient to notice that if their mouth is clean or dirty. Um, the same way that I want to help prevent pressure wounds. So if I go into the room and every time I see the patient, they're lying in the same position, I can help to advocate that you've got to turn the patient every two hours so that we prevent pressure wounds. So using our resources and using our cross training um, is only going to benefit the patients. The last point I wanted to share before we get into the functional goal setting um, is something called the Yale Swallow Protocol, often also called the 90ML Swallow Screen. I've put the web address where it's just a really nice PDF that you can print out. And it also has the um, uh, studies from the dysphagia journal that has the statistics as well in it. Um, and if you Google, you know, this Yale sw Swallow pr Protocol, you'll see 10 plus, I didn't count them all, there's probably about 15, 20 different peer-reviewed studies. This is a simple screening, great for doing a stroke admission protocol to train nurses and for yourselves for confidence. Um, you basically give a patient 90 ml of water, uh, they drink it, if they can drink it without stopping, without changing vocal quality, and without, um, you know, any other signs of aspiration, then 
it has a 97.9% um, probability that aspiration did not occur. Sorry, I have my two numbers a little bit off here, but it's 97.9. Um, which is great probability just from one cup of water. So this is a great way for you to feel confident if they're able to do this one five minute test that aspiration is not occurring. Um, some caveats, it must be done correctly. And if the patient fails, it does mean that they need to have a full clinical swallow evaluation. Failing does not automatically mean NPO. It just means maybe we need to research it further. Um, maybe they need compensatory strategies. Maybe they need diet modification. But this 97.9% uh, probability is pretty great in my opinion. All right, let's go into goal setting and types of goals. Anyone who's met me and talked with me too long knows that I'm passionate about making sure our goals are functional and make sure, making sure that what we do benefits our patients. Um, and so first, quickly, we'll go over the three um, types of goals and uh, kind of some examples of those. So our long-term goals. Every patient should have a long-term goal. These are our best possible outcomes. This is my ideal of what I'm working towards. Uh, this is my best case scenario. So for me, some examples, patient will be able to meet nutritional needs by mouth without signs or symptoms of aspiration. Patient will be able to functionally communicate wants and needs. Uh, patient will have adequate vocal function to communicate with others to easily improve quality of life. Long-term goals are an ideal. Long-term goals are um, generally do not have to be measurable, but they're kind of that end goal of what we're going for. Our short-term goals. Every patient, you know, after evaluation should have maybe one or two long-term goals. And then our short-term goals are our measurable objectives that are the stepping stones of how we can achieve those long-term goals. It's a beautiful goal to say that they'll be able to eat and drink by mouth without any signs of aspiration. My short-term goals will tell me how I get there. That may be, oops, hang on. Oh, I always do stuff like this. There we go. That may be that the patient will complete the Masaka maneuver, the Shakir exercises, and the effortful swallows in sets of 10 each, five times a session. That's my stepping stone to get to that oral intake. Maybe for a child with um, autism spectrum disorder, patient will be able to engage in cooperative play using eye contact and reciprocal interactions times three a session. Maybe for infant feeding, I'm looking for 20 minutes of rhythmic, mature, suck, swallow, breathe feeding without signs or symptoms of distress. These are the goals that I can measure. These are the goals that I can say, yes, we got 50% or we got 100% accuracy. These are the goals that should be changing and progressing throughout their stay or throughout their therapy um, program. And then to me, the most important goals that we often forget about are our patient and family goals. One of the most important questions to ask in every initial meeting is, um, what's the most important thing for you, for your speech and language and swallowing? What, for an outpatient, why did you come to speech therapy? Why did you decide to spend your money to come here? The answers to these questions often help us to understand people's priorities and their motivations. I put some examples of recent um, answers that we've gotten. I want my son to be able to make friends was an answer from a father whose 11-year-old um, has autism spectrum disorder and doesn't have a lot of uh, social interactions at school. Um, another um, family of a stroke patient told us he wants to eat more than he wants to talk. They wanted to focus on swallowing. She only cares about walking. Speech therapy was the least important to her. Physical therapy was the most important with another stroke patient. Um, I had a patient with a traumatic brain injury a few years ago who very low level, very um, just sad injury, worked overseas in the Middle East and came back with a horrible head injury. And he was able to finally tell me, I want to be able to hug my son with both arms and I want to remember how old he is. He had lost about two years of his son's life um, because of his traumatic brain injury. 
Um, I had another family with a child with behavioral problems. I want him to stop throwing everything we give him. A mom recently told us, I want her to be like other kids. So these goals show us what family priorities are. So as we were saying, if we can use their goals as insight, then we can create rapport, we can create relationships and trust, and we can find functional activities that will create success in therapy. If we don't have that long-term goal in sight, we can lose track. We can get so interested in the anatomical changes we see for a voice patient, or we can get so intrigued by their left visual neglect or their severe apraxia of speech, or mm, this is the first time I've ever seen a spastic dysphonia. We can get so into the physiology or the science or the novelty. Oh, this is an interesting trait patient. Wow, I've never seen a trait before. I wonder what to do that we can forget that we're working with a person. Of course, evidence-based practice, understanding the diseases and having a intrinsic having knowledge of the anatomy and physiology guide everything we do but my job is to be able to explain to my patient from the village that's three hours outside of Tencent what a stroke is instead of them just thinking that their dad is um, just trying to be difficult or he doesn't want to talk to them I need to be able to explain what aphasia is if we use measurable standardized scores and testing to collect data and record outcomes, we can have better research and we can also advocate for our profession. Um, here at Green Pastures, we've recently started using the FIM FAM scores, F-I-M slash F-I-M, F-A-M. And these scores are, you do at um, admission and you do at discharge. And it's a score of, ooh, I can't quite remember. This is where I get into tr trouble. I think it's 30 different areas of psychosocial, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and nursing goals. And you can use these worldwide to chart how are we doing with our stroke care. Um, there's measures for spinal cord injury patients. There's voice measures. There's penetration aspiration scales. So using these things can help us who are working in Nepal and in other places to be able to compare to worldwide trends and worldwide standards. Um, so what I've done is I've made three case studies for you and um, there are a few videos mixed in and then I thought we could talk through those and then I believe the plan will be at the end, we can do um, questions and answers. So first case uh, was a gentleman, this was a case for in uh, Tencent and he um, was in his mid-70s. He had a pretty massive left MCA, middle cerebral artery, ischemic cardiovascular accident. So he had a blockage in his uh, left middle cerebral artery, which you guys all know feeds Broca's area, is the artery that gives blood supply to Broca's area and Wernicke's area. So he came to us right after the stroke. He lived um, a bit outside of Butwald, but they decided to bring him up to uh, tends into the mission hospital. He presented with moderate oropharyngeal dysphagia. We put it, he had an NG2 for the first few weeks. Severe global aphasia, oral apraxia, apraxia speech, and was diagnosed with depression post-stroke. He often would be angry. He often required maximal assistance and encouragement to participate in any sort of therapy. Um, so he transitioned from our critical care unit in Tencent to the neuro rehab unit, and he remained in the hospital there for about two months. After that, he came for outpatient therapy intensively. He had family that lived in Tencent, so could uh, come five days a week. And then we were able to figure out with his son via Emo, the um, like the app Emo, to do weekly follow-ups because he um, would often, if I gave a bit of a lecture to him, would do his follow-up activities with his son. And then he came for follow-up in-person visits to see physical therapy, occupational therapy. Uh, we had an, our physician and speech therapy once a month for six months. By the end of all of this, so we're looking at, what's this, eight months, nine months of care, um, he was able to consume a regular diet. 
get comprehension of functional information, increased interactions, his mood was much better, he was showing much less frustration with his family, he wasn't trying to hit his son and, um, you know, he wasn't trying to do those types of things. Uh, he was using gesture and pragmatics to express himself. We had no uh, speech output that was functional. And he also had no desire to use any kind of adaptive communication despite our attempts of picture communication boards. Um, he could not read or write, so we tried with multiple picture boards and he uh, preferred to rely on home gestures. Here's a video. Uh, you'll get to hear uh, my Nepali pronunciation and also that I forget his name in the video when we're doing this. But I think it's a good example of this is one of his outpatient visits after we've already done much intensive therapy. Um, and to me, it's just a good example that he was still willing to try after this long with this level of impairment. So let me play this video. Namaste. Anasna. Namaste. Namaste. Good. Very Namaste. Ani oh, Jonas. Ooh, Banos. Ooh, ooh, good. E, e. That Jonas. E, Banos. E, Ani E. Try to Nam Banos. Nam Banos. Apno Nam Banos. I've no nam banos bua. Lila. No, no, jokan. Jokan, no? Jokan. Jokan banos. Jo. Jo. Pero o ma hernos. Jo. Kan. Jo. Kan. Perigonos. Abajo ni kanos. Jo. Jo. Kan. Yeah. Whew, that's always a difficult video to watch because that's after that's me doing everything I've learned in all of my years of practice. I consulted with every speech therapist I knew with a specialist in apraxia speech. We did every technique we could think of and that was the best we got where occasionally with a visual and a um, tactile cue we could occasionally get following commands to say Ooh, or Jo Khan. Uh, but did you notice that he was smiling? Did you notice that he was engaged with me? That he was still trying? How did we get there? Because I, you know, we didn't start there. Um, one of the things his family first told me was that he, they owned a shop and he'd love to drink tea outside with his friends. And so we found out that if we practiced the word chia, 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 and he could do that at the beginning of the session. And I brought two 10 rupee cups of tea from the hospital canteen. And we sat and drank our tea while we did these, oop, I did it again. While we did these boring goals at the bottom, then he would do speech therapy with me. So by investing in tea once a week, we were able to have a connection. The other thing that was really helpful with him um, because his son and his other family members were at some ways convinced that their father was just not trying, that he just didn't want to, um, uh, like, man, I'm sorry, uh, didn't want to obey. I was trying to switch into Nepali. And so the anal so finding analogies that meant something to them. You know, their family lived in Boudoir. We were in Tencent. The road between at Sita Baba always has landslides. It's just, it's just known for having landslides there. So by explaining apraxia as the road from your brain to your mouth has a landslide on it, and our job by doing all these exercises is to clear the stones out, and it wasn't his fault that there was a landslide. He was trying his best, but he couldn't get through that landslide, was enough that then they had patience with him. So finding an analogy that works. My patients in Pokhara, I found, identify much more if I talk about a traffic jam because they're in a bigger city. They're more used to these big traffic jams. So if I can say, you know how Prithi Vichok gets so jammed sometimes? That's what it's like 
His brain is jammed right now and we have to open back up the roads. Find the analogies that work for your patients. Our next case study is one from here in Pokhara. Um, we're call, I'm calling him Anil. I just thought it'd be fun to change his name. Uh, he's a, well, when we started seeing him, he was two and a half years old. He's, um, his birthday is next month, in fact. Um, his mom, and I'm saying we because now that I'm here in poker, I had the pleasure to work with uh, Deepika, who's a wonderful Nepali speech therapist. Um, so we see quite a few patients together. Um, you know, our initial evaluation, some red flags for autism spectrum. Uh, he only had a very limited expressive language, one or two words, some minimal babbling, comprehension, maybe 12 to 15 month later um, level, some gesturing. He would do, he does an arm up uh, for like, uh, like Malai, like he wants it. Um, and then he was drooling constantly. He was behaviorally hitting, crying, pulling hair, using mom's hand as a tool. Uh, to, to communicate. No cooperative play, fixated on objects, not into people at all, uh, lots of textural feeding aversions. So when we saw him during this initial evaluation, he's tearing around our office, grabbing everything, getting all the toys, you know, totally wild, pulling mom's hair, drooling everywhere. My first thoughts are, we need to do some goals on behavior. We need language comprehension. He has some sensory integration issues. We need to figure out some sort of communication for this little boy. We need to start educating mom on possibility of autism spectrum disorder to get her, you know, kind of thinking about that. But then we asked mom, why did she come to speech therapy? And she said, he doesn't talk like other children. And when we are out, I can't, he can't drink a fruity because he can't use a straw. So I can't buy him a fruity on the road the way all my friends can for their children. So guess what we did the first session? In 10 minutes, we taught him how to use a straw. It worked. He drank from a straw. We got one in the, you know, we did one in the speech therapy room. He drank from a straw. Mom almost was in tears because she hadn't ever been able to get her son to do something normal, like drink a fruity on the road. I would have never put that as a short-term goal. I would have never said, child will be able to use a straw for a fruity. This is a kid who couldn't say anything and he's pulling his hair and he's drooling everywhere. There are bigger things, but you know what? Because we met one of mom's two goals, the mom now believes speech therapy. She's engaged in our sessions. She comes faithfully to speech therapy. Um, she trusts us and you know, she's able to respond and she's able to try the things that we do with him now because I think we built the trust in that first session. It doesn't always work like that. We felt like it was kind of just an amazing thing that he could do that straw really quickly. Um, he's still coming to, well he was before Bamba, still coming before the lockdown, still coming to therapy um, and he's progressing well um, with some, some words. Still not normal, but progressing. Um, our next case study is a current patient who is at the hospital here at Green Pastures now. He is another gentleman in his mid-50s. And um, let's see, I'll do it. And that's uh, Mag, the 17th of Nepali month, but January 31st. Uh, he had a left middle cerebral artery ischemic CVA with right hemiparesis, global aphasia. Uh, I put questionable apraxia of speech when he first came in. We were not sure now. I feel pretty confident that it seems like apraxia of speech. Severe, profound, or pharyngeal dysphagia. He came from Kathmandu to Green Pastures, nine days post-stroke with an NG uh, tube in place, and he pulled his NG tube consistently every one or two days and had it to be replaced. Uh, he had a G tube, a uh, uh, gastronomy tube. Um, actually, his was a jujostomy tube, so a bit lower, so it should be a J tube, sorry. Uh, March 15th, after we did three fees that revealed severe silent aspiration. Starting now, he had minimal alertness, attention, and engagement in therapeutic tasks. Um, I'm going to apologize 
we have just started doing fees, fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing at Green Pastures. Um, and for Deepika, I am pretty technologically um, an advanced. So we've got some videos that we just took from my cell phone. And then sadly, I thought we had the video of our final fees that I recorded on the device. And now I can't get it off the hard drive. So I'm sorry, I can't show you that. Um, so this is just a still image, his first fees. Um, the first thing we noticed, and here you can see, we saw severe uh, thrush, or I can't ever say this word correctly, canadiasis noted. Um, in minimal swallows throughout and severely decreased sensation with silent aspiration of his secretions. So the first thing we noticed is if you have this much thrush in your um, pharyngeal area, anytime you swallow, you're going to hate it. It's going to hurt. It's going to cause a yucky taste and it's going to impair your sensation. So the first thing we did is show this image to our doctors and say, look, I showed him on my phone, so I'm steady like this. Look, can, what can we do? Um, can you guys get medication started because we need to get this cleared up? No wonder he doesn't want to swallow with us in therapy. No wonder we can't get him to do any exercises. This would be miserable. Um, next phase we did. The sec See, this is me. Sorry, guys. The second one, um, somehow I can't find a video of that either. So his third phase. Um, this is the phase we were... Um, at about six weeks out and we needed to, uh, of having an NG tube in place, which um, I don't, you know, normally you don't want to have an NG tube in for longer than six to eight weeks. Even if you're changing it, just having one in place for that long can cause tracheoesophageal uh, fistula or can cause uh, pharyngeal ulcerations. So it's usually recommended by about that six to eight week mark of NPO fed by NG2 that you figure out something else to do. Um, so this was our last phase before deciding if a G tube or J tube needed to be placed. Um, so I'll show you this video. This is a clip at the end. And we use this video um, mainly for his family because it's, it's a big thing to have to say you're gonna put a tube in someone's stomach. And so by using um, fees as a teaching tool, we could help them. So you'll be uh, looking, again, sorry, it's not the great quality. You'll see a cough coming up and you'll see everything coming out of the vocal cords that had been previously aspirated. We dye everything blue for contrast so that we can see everything better. And then he, he's got a lot of secretions that he's not managing. You can also see that's why the string keeps fogging some. Just push down on your tongue. Let's see. It like, seems like my video is freezing a little bit. You may need to go back and try to rewatch. That's the base of tongue at the bottom of the screen, and then that's his epiglottis. And we had a few people observing that day as well. So you hear me speaking in the background. Let me pop pause it and see if we can get the video to load a little bit better. The main purpose of this fees was to help his family be able to visualize what was going on because everyone says, well, he's not coughing. He must be able to eat. Um, I did two minutes, and let, so let's see if we can get the video. I'm so sorry the video is not streaming well. I can try to, um, if you want to put your you know, send your email to me, I can try to email it to you. So you'll see here the vocal cords um, at the posterior aspect of the vocal cords here. You can just see that going in like a waterfall. That is silent aspiration. It is gross silent aspiration because none of it is going to his esophagus. His upper esophageal sphincter has not opened. Um, that is just all going straight down to his lungs. By taking the time to explain that to his family, we were able, oops, sorry, we were able to um, help them come to grips with the fact that a G2 being placed, oh, here I've got some dates here, 
being played March 15th was a great idea. Getting that NG tube out changed his motivation. It wasn't hurting to swallow. He worked so hard with us after that. We did another fee, final fees at the end of April. Um, and his G tube was removed two days ago, which was so exciting. He is able to eat and drink by mouth, a normal diet with small sips sitting upright and, um, you know, just very slow pace. So he's going home. Well, we heard he's maybe going tomorrow, maybe going Friday. I think, you know, with this lockdown situation, it's up in the air. Um, still minimal verbal output. He's walking with a cane. His left upper extremity is not moving at all. But he is happy and he's able to eat and he can go home and be with his family. Um, so another thing that really was helpful to us is we were having him have a lot of periods of not wanting to do therapy. And then somehow during the lockdown period, I've got two kids at home and my husband's working as well. So I found that I could go to work early and see my few patients that I still have. And I found out that if I went at 830 before physio and OT got there, before everything started, he did fantastic in therapy with me. He would concentrate on therapy and he would do all this speech therapy things. But if I tried to come at 10 o'clock, when everyone was around, he had a lot of embarrassment about his speech because he was he had better comprehension. And so he would tell me no, and he wouldn't do speech therapy. So um, timing and figuring out his personality really made, have made a big difference in his care. Um, our jobs have to be client focused. Uh, this m new mom had never been able to hold her preterm infant before because he was so critically ill. It is not my job to help a mom hold her baby for the first time, but what joy for me to take an extra 10 minutes after doing some non-nutritive sucking and oral stimulation with the baby to let this mom hold her baby the first time. The little girl in the other picture was terrified of wheelchair. She has autism spectrum disorder. And every time she saw a wheelchair, she would sit on the ground and cry. By riding around in a wheelchair with me, we were able to desensitize her. So she didn't have this huge reaction that made her grandmother's life much more difficult. We have to empower families to know that they can help their child and that they're capable. This was another mom that this baby has severe HIE, um, or brain um, anoxia. I think we're at less than a minute, it's telling me. So if we get cut off, um, I think we just come back into the meeting if I'm correct. This is the last of the slides and then we can do questions. So when it cuts off, we'll just go back in. Yes, um, I think but finish the presentation. We can come back again. We have a few questions and we yes. have a discussion. That would be wonderful. Great. I think, um, shall we just go ahead and leave now? Yeah, you we think? can do that. I'll, I'll end the meeting for now and everybody can join again and we'll continue with the question and answer. And I'm sorry if someone typed questions Jerry, and I didn't have it up on the screen, so you'll have to retype in the next session. I apologize for that. I've, I've copied the question so I can post it to you. Oh, great job. Thank you. <laughs> so please click the link again and we'll see you in a minute. Okay, thank you. Welcome back everyone. So we'll wait for some time for Sarah to join again and then we, we can take it from there. We have a few questions which were asked earlier. If you have any questions, so you can go into the chat section, type the questions there and we will we'll have a discussion now. We're still waiting for Sarah to join. Okay, are we back, I think? Yes, we are back. 
Thank you. Sorry, for my technology. I'm technology impaired. Um, <laughs> <We> <laughs> why, don't I, why don't I show the last few slides? I think I have two more slides, and then we can do questions if that sounds all right. So yes. can I do? I can do share screen again. I think maybe. Yes, you can do that. Uh, I think you'll have to disable or okay. let me. Yeah. Are you able to say it now? Yes, okay. Yeah. Let's back open. Um, so as I was saying, this was a family that the baby, we tried so many things to get this baby to be able to eat by mouth. Um, finally, we did a finger feeder for oral stimulation. And the baby was able to take small amounts like this. It was great that I could do it with my finger and I could do it and it was great. I'd done it a million times. But look at how happy this mom is that she can feed her son. They were able to go back to their village. They lived in um, St. Job uh, district uh, right near Walling. And one time I was on a bus and somehow they spotted me from the road on the bus and called my mobile and said he was growing and walking and uh, able to breastfeed. Uh, so it was a great reminder that we uh, do have a role. This is another patient, Govinda. Uh, he had Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS, and being able to just hear his voicing, even though he was still ventilator dependent, this is of course with physicians present and their approval um, post-suctioning. Uh, this was done for a few moments towards, oh goodness, I've done it again. Uh, but him being able to try his voice was so important. Make sure you daddy. Banos na. Ah, go in the banos. Banos. Ah, banos. Ah, go in the. Banos. So by doing something for that five seconds, you know, deflating the cuff, trying that first for, for some time, taking him off the ventilator, doing manual occlusion. It was a step for us to be able to show the doctors and show uh, him and other people that maybe we could try to progress in his goals because we uh, did not often see this acute level of patients in Tencent. Uh, some final thoughts from me. Uh, it's always important to take the time to build the rapport and the relationships with our patients. If our patients appreciate us and enjoy us, they tell their doctors. Doctors then get to hear that speech therapy is beneficial. And we also get to uh, advocate for ourselves that we do have an important role in lots of different settings. You know, not just kids who can't speak, which is what, you know, I get told all the time. Um, our scope of practice needs to and can adapt based on location and needs. Um, in Tencent, I was seeing more and more infants because we had quite a big maternity service there. And in the United States, most of my NICU practice was done with bottle feeding. At Tencent, it was mainly done with breastfeeding. So I needed to do lactation consulting, so I was able to get that degree. Here in Pokhara, our outpatient caseload is hugely uh, focused on autism spectrum disorder. So during this lockdown time, I've been taking advantage of some continuing education classes and have done 20-ish hours on autism spectrum because that's not an area that I have treated uh, in a long time. And so it's good for me to learn those things as well. So sadly, I'm not doing as much infant feeding, which I love, but I am doing a lot more um, of autism spectrum disorder care. Um, feel free to email me with questions as well about specifics. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. So I'll do stop share. And then I guess, shall I open the chat? What's the best way for me to do? Yeah, I can read the questions for you or okay. you can go through the chat, whichever is easy way for you. You, you. Why don't you start with reading and we can do those first. And then um, I see one or two questions on the side as well, but why don't we start with the um, yes. ones you already have? Yes, I'll do that. Just before that, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I think it took me back somewhere like 15 years before when I was just a, like graduate undergrad student. And mm -hmm. we, we were taught about how you should set a goal, think about mm -hmm. smart, like be specific. 
it should mm-hmm. be measurable and you should I, I don't even remember the like whatever the acronym was for smart was for but i i feel like you know going back that i've not been doing speech for so long but it feels so good setting up goals are so important and it has to be tailor made to each and everybody that's what mm-hmm. i think was the major highlight of your presentation for me and right. It goes to every everyone, I guess, apart like speech or audio. I ha- we have to be telemanding. So that's true. I think that there are big. Um, I think that there are big applications to audio as well as to what people want to work on, what type of hearing aids they want to use as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it can apply to everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. So I'll go with some of the questions which we have now. So. Okay. Yeah, the first question is, which all therapeutic approach can we apply in global aphasia cases? Mm. So in global aphasia, um, that's a big question. I'll do my best uh, to answer it shortly, and then we can keep going from there. Global aphasia normally progresses from a global aphasia to more of a Broca's aphasia. So you tend to get back some comprehension before you get back expression. So for me, um, I always think we need to focus on comprehension types of things first. Um, so, and we need to focus on comprehension and compensation. So, if I need, if I'm saying, do you want a cup or do you want a mobile? I need them to be able to understand those two words first. And so, you know, for global aphasia, starting with comprehension types of tasks, very basic using visuals, um, trying to do some yes and no's or oh or why not, doing some gesture types of things is very important. And then to me, always I try to do some automatic naming tasks because I do think if we do automatic tasks, you know, saying the numbers one through five while we're touching the fingers for a lot of tactile, you know, however they like to count, if they like to count like this, if they like to count like this, however they like to count to do that to do the days of the week, to do the months of the year. However, and I try to do it as best we can in whatever their home language is. Um, you know, I don't speak Nawari, I don't speak Magar, but if the family member can, I can direct the family to do it in the home language. I do try to do that. Um, and then the other thing I always do, and it's mainly for motivation reasons, is if they have any singing or any songs that they used to like, as we try to play that and sing along um, for therapeutic benefit, but also lots of times with singing, you get a bit more um, words out. And so it can be a huge motivator to be able to sing even something kind of silly. Okay, so uh, the next question is a kind of a guess related question. So it's, um, person who has asked the question said, I had one patient of global aphasia with apraxia mm-hmm. of speech. Her comprehension was quite good. After starting therapy session, her verbal and non-verbal cap- capabilities increased, but her frustration increased day by day. Even after doing adequate counseling, I was not able to control her frustration. Then I decided to stop the therapy session for a few days. What should we do in such kind of situation? You know, that is a great question. I gave a presentation um, a few weeks ago to our uh, physio and occupational therapist here at Green Pastures, and we talked about um, how aphasia can be so frustrating. You know, someone with Wernicke's aphasia who has no comprehension, they think everyone else has the problem. So even though I'm saying da 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 in my brain I'm saying normal things, so it's your fault that I can't comprehend. Someone with Broca's aphasia um, or someone who has good comprehension, you know, a global aphasia who's evolving, um, they know they're more prone to depression um, and they're more prone to frustrations. This is why I always, I think taking a break was a great idea. I think motivating them and trying. um, And I think also acknowledging, you know, I um, do tend to say, that we, you know, I keep, I say this isn't easy. You know, it's a hard thing around the world. I wish that there was a medicine for this to make it better, but there's not, you know, and I, and I try to explain that we're going to try our best to build. Taking a break for a few days maybe was a great thing. Um, Another thing to do is think about something fun to do in therapy, perhaps, um, because I know if you show me picture cards every day, 
Um, I am bored of picture cards. So maybe going outside, if you have that capability, or maybe looking at pictures of on a mobile. Lots of times when my patients are frustrated, I show them videos of my mobile and they sometimes love to see my kids. And I know that part of that's the novelty of my little white children. But, um, you know, showing them funny movies. We'll look at videos of dogs doing tricks or things. Try to give, your, give them a break when they're feeling frustrated and try to think of different types of things you can do as well. But it's not easy, I agree. And I think, I mean, if I may add, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of the cases which you discussed from Tansen, where you talked about like having tea every day because mm -hmm. he loved having mm -hmm. tea. So getting things which people are more like um, um, happy to do rather than, you know, which they feel exactly. compelled to do might be a better way to get the best out of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do a lot of, um, you know, games and things as well. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, if I have a deck of cards, um, maybe they used to play different card games mm -hmm. and they're not at the level to play those card games, but maybe we can sort the cards and as we sort the cards, maybe we can say um, black or we can say red or we can say which suit it is. So that it's a familiar object um, to use as well. Yeah, I think that that's a great idea is to find, find something that was meaningful to them before. Um, yeah. I've had so many people telling me, you know, Let's talk about, is it rice planting time right now or is it this planting time? And, you know, talking about those different things, showing pictures. Um, if you have a lot of patients who live in the village or who have come from a village, showing pictures of village life and kind of talking about those types of things can often make it a lot more meaningful than here's a picture of an apple, here's a picture of this, here's a picture of this, do more contextual types of things. Uh, so the next next question is uh, it's related to dyspedia. So how long should we wait for swallow assessment after extubation, or we can start as soon as possible? So um, most guidelines in the United States say 24 hours post extubation. You should if sorry, let me let me back that up. If a patient has been intubated for more than 24 hours, you would need to do a swallow evaluation before um, letting them have PO feeding. So, you know, you're intubated for a surgery for four hours, you don't normally need to do a swallow evaluation. And then from the moment of extubation, you would wait 24 hours before you would do the swallowing evaluation because lots of, um, there's been a few studies that have showed that vocal cord sensitivity and sensation takes about 24 hours to show again. So you're at a very high risk of silent aspiration for that first 24 hours of extubation. Um, in the United States, I worked at a large 800 bed. Um, it was a level, um, like the highest level trauma hospital. And our doctors and nurses hated that we waited 24 hours for these patients, but we needed to. And so we would you know, say, okay, well, what time did you extubate? And we would try very hard to come that time the next day. So you extubate at three in the afternoon. I'm going to be there at 301 the next day. Um, waiting 24 hours is best practice. Um, and also, when after you wait, you need to make sure you do a nice voice assessment um, and look for risk factors um, with that before you just rule out silent aspiration as well. The longer you've been intubated, the higher risk you are. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, the next question is again on dysphagia. So what all consideration and swallowing therapist should take care of if the patient is drooling a lot or have dry mouth during assessment? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, normally we swallow uh, just reflexively. All of us sitting here, we swallow three to four times a minute. So I'm managing my secretions. I'm not thinking about it. If I'm drooling, that shows me, you know, about, especially adults. Let me, let me separate that, actually. Um, adults who've had a neurologic event, you know, stroke, brain injury, um, post-surgery, intubation, those types of things. If they are drooling, let me separate with that, then that um, is usually a sign that they have poor um, reflexive swallowing and poor sensation 
when my mouth is filled with saliva, I'm going to, I'm going to swallow because I don't want to drool. Um, on the other side, if they have a very dry, so that to me is a sign of decreased sensation and awareness. So I'm already kind of thinking they're at a higher risk of aspiration if they cannot manage their secretions. I know it wasn't great and I'm so sorry. I'm going to, poor Deepika um, is going to have to help me to make sure we do a better job capturing um, images on our feeds that we're doing now so we can use those for teaching. Uh, but in that first fees photo, his secretions were just being aspirated all the way down. When we saw him at bedside, he was drooling all the time. He always had drool on the affected side. So they correlate normally. So if I see poor oral secretion management, high risk of aspiration silently is what I'm thinking. Um, dry mouth on the other side, uh, I'm going to look at oral care. You know, I'm going to check the mucosa. Every swallowing evaluation, every time we see a patient who has not been eating or who possibly needs to be NPO or anything, we need to talk about their oral care. Do they have, if they have dry mucosa, do they possibly have thrush in their mouth that we need to uh, tell the doctors about so we can get a medicine? Lots of our patients here are prescribed a lot of antibiotics at one time, which causes a huge um, amount or probability of getting thrush. Um, and so I think we've had, uh, see, I'm gonna mess this up. We had three patients admitted last week with strokes from different um, hospitals, and they all three had oral thrush because they had so many antibiotics at their um, prior setting. Um, Dry mouth often can be thrush. Dry mouth often can be mouth breathing. Um, so if you're breathing from your mouth because you have poor respiratory control, perhaps poor diaphragm movement, perhaps you're doing clavicular breathing, perhaps your breathing and swallowing are discoordinated, you could have a much drier mouth. So mouth breathing is not the normal. Um, so that's something else I watch in those patients. It would be a sign of uh, possible difficulty with respiration. Um, the next question I see says, what can SLP do for drooling management? Yes. Um, I think for that, I'm assuming we're talking about in children. Um, drooling in adults, you know, usually is another reason, um, unless if it's an adult with a developmental uh, congenital disorder such as cerebral palsy. Um, a lot of what uh, my practice is for drooling is to Number one, increase awareness. Most of these kids who drool have very, I don't want to say, well, most have, I think I can say most, have pretty poor muscle tone facially. Um, and a lot of times they also have poor uh, tongue or lingual muscle tone. So they're kind of flaccid. Um, so their tongue is a bit protruded and they have an open mouth posture at rest. So the first thing we teach, and then the moms, are so lovely and every time the child drools, they wipe their face. And then the child drools again and they wipe their face. Child drools, they wipe their face. So the first thing we do, and these poor mothers, I say, before you wipe their face, you have to close their mouth and say swallow. Because it's the same with everything with children, with behavioral types of therapy. If I cry and pull your hair and you give me a chocolate, why would I ever stop crying and pulling your hair? I'm the same way. If I get something and I, if I whine, if I cry and I get something, that's, that's enforcing that I should keep doing that. If I drool and my mouth is automatically wiped, then why would I, why would I need to close my mouth and swallow? Why would I need to use my muscle tone? So teaching parents oral massage, you know, using Abicularia oris and ooh, somebody who can remember this muscle who hasn't been out of school as much as me can remember that muscle. You know, is we're going to teach massage. We're going to teach some sensory awareness. We're going to teach to close your mouth and swallow. We're going to teach using a spoon to do a bit of um, lingual press to help that child think about tongue in the mouth and swallowing. Um, I've seen it be effective in as few as two weeks. I've seen it take much longer, um, and a lot of that is empowering the moms to to stop wiping first and let them. So we, you know, we just during the whole therapy session, no matter what we're doing, I'm about two minutes, 
How about swallow? Go ahead, swallow. Um, all right, I think the next question, Bebek, sir, is about cognitive assessments. Is this the one you're seeing as well? Yes, that's the one. Okay, so what we do, um, you know, on any evaluation, um, we've recently made a speech language assessment form, a swallowing assessment form, or sorry, speech language cognitive assessment form and a swallowing assessment form that we're trying to standardize and use at Green Pastures. And um, so we do do a basic cognitive assessment on all of our stroke patients. Um, you know, of course, you guys know these types of things. First thing I'm going to do is a chart review. I'm going to look at the CT or the MRI first, and I'm going to be thinking, okay, you know, left um, CVA, left hemisphere CVA, I'm probably thinking more language disorders. Oh, you know, brain stem, oh, could have some balance and some. Uh, swallowing, okay, right CVA, probably problem solving and reasoning. So I'm using my clinical judgment and my expertise, and then I'm going to tailor my evaluation to that. But we do ask orientation questions. We ask a few problem solving questions. We ask, um, what else we ask? We ask like uh, organization tasks, convergent naming, you know, name, ten, name as many animals as you can. We ask uh, step by step, usually here. Uh, you know, we, how do you make a cup of tea? Tell me all the steps to make a cup of tea. We ask a few safety questions and we do that with all of our stroke patients. Um, and then if we are finding cognitive deficits, we will go deeper um, and use, you know, one of the, like the uh, MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. There's the um, Evans Right Hemisphere Assessment and we'll use those types of tests as well to go deeper into the deficits that we're seeing. You know, we ask some memory questions as well. So we are trying, and, and the other great thing is by doing those types of things, I'm also hearing dysarthria. I'm seeing um, if there's any anomia. I'm, you know, seeing if there's comprehension deficits. So I'm assessing language with my straight patients while I'm doing cognition. So I, I think it's a great way to do both. Um, and next question, most patients with aphasia ends up with apraxia features. Is it so? You know, more and more, yeah, you know, the, the bigger the stroke, the bigger the area affected, the more chances we have of uh, mixed diagnosis. It's very rare, I think, for us to see a classic uh, transcortical motor aphasia or to see a classic dysarthria and nothing else is wrong because strokes, you know, the areas are intercorrect connected. We do see quite a lot of people with apraxia um, of speech uh, who are aphasia patients as well. The other thing to think about is um, phonemic paraphasias can often look like apraxia. So thinking about and knowing the difference between the two can be really helpful to you um, because oftentimes the treatment is a little bit different with that. Um, but yes, I do agree that uh, I think I've always been hesitant to diagnose apraxia of speech, uh, but the more strokes I see and the more severe strokes I see over the years, the more comfortable I am with saying, yes, that is apraxia of speech. And you know, the example I gave was really clear cut. He had oral apraxia as well. He couldn't even close his mouth to command. Um, but it's often a lot more subtle than that case. Um, is it important to set a goal during trial therapy? You know, I think it is. I think um, to say, well, do you want to, you know, for, I think one of the goals, the little, the boy that we, um, so one, I think one of the goals I said was that his family and he said he wasn't able to make friends. It was a, I think he's 11, 11 or 12 year old with autism spectrum disorder. And so we said, you know, we can, we can try some social pragmatic types of therapy things. Let's try it for a month and see how you got, if, if you feel like it's helpful, if we feel like it's helpful, because this is, um, you know, it's not our everyday thing. Um, and so for him, you know, we set some, 
our goal was a bit more broad. You know, our goal was that he would engage in social conversation. He would do topic maintenance, you know, during the sessions. But I do think it's important to have a goal for trial therapy because I think if we can tell families on day of evaluation and tell patients on day of evaluation, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I think we need to do to work on it. And then at the end of that month, if I can say, what do you guys think? Do you think this voice therapy's helped you or not? Um, here's what we worked on, here's what we saw. What do you think? I'm finding nine times out of 10, they're saying, yeah, I think it's helpful. Um, and maybe I'm personally not seeing a ton of improvement, but they are feeling much more confident. Um, and so I think, I think if we set goals and if we can communicate those goals clearly in that first session, then it will only to make their relationship of the trial therapy possibly turn into more than trial therapy. Um, the next question I see is, is oral motor therapy effective for children with cerebral palsy? Is it still in practice? That's a good and loaded question. Um, some, I think, uh, how's it, oral motor exercises do not show a lot of evidence for adult populations. So, you know, we, you know, the exercises we give, I, what I usually do for adults is I say, you don't like your facial droop, do these exercises in front of the mirror and it'll, it could get improved. I'm not wasting my therapy time on that. I'm going to do evidence-based practice instead. You know, I'm going to do Shakir's, Masako's, Mendelssohn's. I'm going to do aphasia, apraxia therapy. Um, for children, it's a little bit different. Uh, there are some uh, proponents. Sorry, my brain is blanking out right now, though. There are some that say, you know, the chewy tubes and the oral motor things are very effective for children with cerebral palsy. Um, in my personal practice, I try to do as much function as I can. Um, and I think that you'll probably hear me say the word functional, functional, functional. So instead of teaching, stick your tongue out, put your tongue in, I'd rather have the mom bring um, a little snack and us practice eating the snack, closing our lips, swallowing and moving our tongue back. I'd rather put a bit of honey on the roof of the mouth to practice licking the honey off to do functional tasks versus this ooh -ee, ooh -ee, ooh -ee, with children. I think that there's much more functional. For dysarthria, um, the, um, you know, most of the practice is switching to, for dysarthria therapy, you're gonna do speech words and sounds um, versus non-speech uh, movements. So you're gonna do speech movements instead of non-speech movements. So function, function, function is my rule. Okay, uh, I think those are all the questions that were asked um, today. I think we got something just now. Great. Ooh, okay. That's a very long one. <laughs> okay, let me, let me read this one. I will not read it out loud. I think everyone can see. Yeah, okay. Um, is it verbal or nonverbal? Whew, okay. You know, this is, um, thank you, talk tools. Um, that, that's the oral structure massage kits that I was could not remember the name of. Sorry, the next question down. You know, I use talk tools and chewy tubes sometimes. I can't get them so often here, so every once in a while I do use them. Um, I try to use functional things that people can get in their own houses because I um, you know, I've tended to work in low resource settings, so I try to modify things as well as I can. All right, we've got a few minutes left, so let me look at this long question with autism. Um, you know, I think at the beginning of therapy, uh, I usually always am thinking about first, instead of verbal or nonverbal, I'm first thinking about how can I do functional communication right now? And how can I improve it in the future? How can I compensate so that frustration decreases? And how can I rehabilitate or habilitate to make it better? So I'm going to try verbal as much as I can. 
But as I'm trying verbal, I'm either going to teach signs, I'm going to teach text, I'm going to teach um, gesture, because most of the things that I was just learning over the past few weeks are these things are only going to benefit. You know, every time I, I do a PEX, you know, a picture exchange, I'm still saying, um, give me, give me the ball. Do you, oh, you want to play with the ball? Let's do the ball. Oh, look, it's time for our, we try to keep a very structured therapy for our children with autism. Oh, look, it's, time for our namaste song and we do a, a namaste song at the beginning and we do a bye-bye song at the end look it's time for namaste song so by using communication tools would only increase um if i'd been seeing someone for three years i think it's saying um but he's not able to talk even a single word yes please 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 start doing pecs start doing other communications um these kids could be brilliant. They could be able to use a smartphone if they have access to it. And there's, um, sorry, I'm gonna look at my phone and get the name of the app. Um, there's an app called Let Me Talk. Ooh, that's not showing up, but it's called Let Me Talk. And it's a basic AAC device that you can type things in and they can point to pictures. I'd try something like that with this kid first if he's got great comprehension. Try a make a board of 12 pictures or start with four pictures, make a board and see if they can use that. And if they can, that's only going to increase. We've got a girl now that we've made a, um, we sent him all the pictures right at the beginning of the lockdown. So I'm so interested to know how she's doing with it, but she's great. She's got comprehension, but her verbal output is limited to kind of a bye-bye and kind of a few other bus sounds. Um, so we made her pictures that they can put on a ring so she can carry it around with her and show her pictures. Um, and so I'm so interested to see if that technique works because it was working in therapy some before. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I fully believe start it, start concurrently to do both. Yeah, I think uh, those are all the questions that we have for today. It was a very informative and uh, I mean, involved, I, involving presentation and i must say thank you very much for taking wow. time and resources to enlighten us with mm -hmm. all your experiences we can see thank that you so much have, <laughs> we can see that you have been through a lot and you have seen so many things that you can share the knowledge with us uh, yeah. there has been a few requests for you so i'll communicate with you via mail and uh, okay. we, we can come into any kind of yeah. if possible yeah thank you and i you know i i uh one of the things i love about getting to work here in nepal is that i get to share knowledge with um, different professionals so thank you so much for allowing me this platform and i'm so glad that i think one of the biggest um, benefits of this lockdown time in covid 19 is that we have started doing meetings like this with lots of different things so thank you thank you so much for letting me share yes definitely so we'll be in touch and hopefully we'll have something sooner and we'll see you again. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone. Those who attended today, uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good day. Stay safe. Stay home. Bye-bye. Thank you.